What does the perfect game of chess look like? Now, I'm not talking about every move being absolutely perfect. No one's capable of that. Even computers aren't capable of that. We know that because computers of the future will beat computers of today. No, I'm talking about the flow of the game. What does it look like? First, you need a strong opponent. Then you create a weakness. You use that weakness, put pressure on it to create a second weakness. You go back and forth between the two weaknesses, cause your opponent's pieces to become uncoordinated, and then you strike like a cobra with a tactical blow. This is what Bobby Fischer used to do. And in this game, Alareza Ferruja does the same thing. His opponent is David Anton Guajaro. Hope I'm pronouncing it that hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. And this is really a well-played, very fluid game. Welcome to Chess Dog. My name is John Montgomery. Let's dive right in between I mean, Alareza Ferruja and David Guajaro. Ferruja has the white pieces. He begins with d4, knight f6, knight f3, d5, bishop to f4. He plays the London system. Not a real ambitious opening. He just wants to outplay his opponent in the middle game. c5, e3. Knight c6, knight b to d2, c d4, e d4. And uh, Guajaro plays bishop to f5. That makes sense. You want to get the bishop outside of the pawn chain before you play e6. But Perugia plays a move that's been popular at the highest level. They have been playing c3 here. Um, but bishop to b5 aims to put immediate pressure on the knight at c6, and if black, say, plays e6, then all of a sudden white can play knight to e5, piling on this c6 knight. The moves may go like this, queen b6, c4, d c4, bishop takes knight with check, the pawn has to retake, knight d c4, and from this position, white can work on those two weaknesses at a7 and c6. Um, in my database, white has like an 80% score from this position, so you don't want to fall into that situation. So black plays rook to c8, immediately defending that knight, and you don't want to play e6 yet. That bishop might want to go back to d7. c3 is then played, e6, and queen to e2. Now this gets the queen opposite the opponent's king. It protects the bishop at b5, but more significant is what it doesn't do. What doesn't it do? Well, it doesn't castle. Uh, Ferruja, again, is happy to play a little um, fast and loose with his own king if it means he can get an edge somewhere else on the board. And he wants to be able to use those kingside pawns aggressively. So he delays castling. Knight to d7. Black wants to control that e5 square. h4, beginning to gain space on the kingside. And if he can get Black's light squared bishop off the board, he could advance the g-pawn also. A6, bishop to d3, bishop takes, queen takes, so the bishop is now off the board. Bishop to e7, king to f1. Looks like he wants to leave that rook on h1 to support that h-pawn and gain space on the king side. Queen to b6, attacks the pawn at b2, and he just defends it. Rook to b1. Then the queen goes to b5. Now this forces the exchange of queens, because the queen is pinned to the king. Um, but Black's willing to accept pawn weaknesses on a7 and, oh, excuse me, b7 and b5. Let's look at that. Takes, takes. Um, but it's yet to be determined whether or not these pawns are weak. There was a very famous game of Capablanca's many years ago, obviously decades ago, where he had a weakness like this and was actually able to win by taking advantage of the open files and maneuvering his knight. In this case, the colors are reversed from the Capablanca game, in this case to the c4 square. So. The pawns are weak, but it gives black some play also. a3 to control that b4 square. Black would have just played b4 and liquidated the weakness immediately otherwise. h5 to keep white from gaining space by playing h5 himself. Now knight to b3. This is a, a move that we call it prophylaxis in chess, where you basically play a move to stop your opponent from doing what they want to do. And uh, what black wanted to do was play knight a5 to c4. The knight at b3 prevents the knight from going to a5, so he can't even do what he wants to do. So Ferruja's stopping Black's plan before it even starts.
f6 to tuck his king away at f7 and to uh, maybe expand in the center later. Uh, however, it makes this square on e6 a little sensitive, and that's going to be an issue as the game progresses. In fact, Ferugia immediately plays rook to e1, taking aim at the e6 pawn. King to f7 defends, now knight to c1. He's saying, I'm going to let black do what he wants on the queen side, but I want to play the knight to d3, move my bishop, and then play the knight to f4, so the knight at f4 and the rook at e1 will both t attack e6. The knight f8 defends the pawn, knight d3, knight g6 hitting the bishop, bishop to g3, and this way, if white's knight lands on f4, black could just take it off the board. That's sort of the idea behind that maneuver. But now knight to a5. Black is able to get the knight to c4, as he originally wanted to do. King to g1, knight to c4, puts pressure on b2. It's defended by the knight at d3 at the moment. Rook to e2. Uh, prepares to double the rooks on that half-open e-file against e6. The king goes to h2, the rook h goes to e1, and he piles up on e6. Rook h to e8, king h2, bishop f8, rook h to e1. So white has pressure on e6, uh, but black has compensation in the well-placed knight on c4. b6, that keeps the knight on d3 out of the c5 square permanently. It wasn't really threatening to jump in yet, but that way he doesn't have to worry about it in the future. King to g1. Uh, I think, you know, a move like this is sort of challenging black to find a move. It's hard for black to move. Almost any move he makes sort of weakens his position. It's not Zugzwang yet, but uh, it's hard for black to find a move. Rook to a8, bishop to f4, rook a to c8. If he, if he took on f4, the knight takes on f4, and uh, he's hitting e6 uh, just as he wanted to. Black still has some pressure on b2, though. Rook a to c8, g3, rook to c6, king g2, bishop e7, and knight to g1. And Ferugia continues to maneuver, giving his opponent a chance to make a mistake. One thing about a position like this for white is you can you can do this. You can move around, and black always has to react. Black's the one that always has to make sure they don't blunder, whereas white has a lot of comfortable, easy moves to make. So Farouche is giving his opponent a chance to make a mistake. His opponent's rated 2679, so he's very, very strong. The chance he's going to make a basic mistake is low, but you might as well give him a chance to if it's not going to harm you in any way. Bishop goes back to f8, knight to h3, bishop e7, knight back, bishop f8, knight back, bishop e7. So black is happy with the draw, uh, but Ferugia does not go for the threefold repetition. He, again, he plays king to h3, rook to a8, now bishop to c1. What this does is it defends the pawn on b2, it allows the knight on d3 to move away uh, without weakening that b2 pawn and making it a target. Rook to e8. Now, all this maneuvering... Ferugia decides to go with his next plan. He's got the weakness at e6, but that's sufficiently defended. Now he creates what we talked about in the opening, the second weakness that he can start to work on. And the weakness he's going to target is the g7 pawn. He begins by opening the g file with g4. Pawn takes, king takes, rook goes to h8, attacking the h4 pawn. h5. Now here, black plays the move knight to f8, it might have been a better choice, uh, the computer likes this idea, of, to play, of playing f5 check immediately, king g3. Uh, if rook h5, b3 hits that knight, um, and uh, the, if the knight went to a3, that would be a mistake, because now the knight could check, and after takes takes, he's forking the king and the rook, so that would not work. But what he could do instead is play the intermediate move, Bishop to d6 check, forcing white's king to move, and now he has two minor pieces controlling e5. Uh, after a move like knight to a5, um, even after rook e6, knight h4 check, knight h4, rook h4, um, black is still okay in that position. But if you're under pressure for so many moves, you're going to make some inaccuracy. So he plays knight to f8, a little passive. Um, the knight comes into f4. We've already talked about that square. He's threatening e6, g6, and also right now he could play knight takes d5 because there's a pin on the e-file. So bishop to d8 to get out of that pin. Rook to h1, defends the pawn. Rook to g8, 
Um, computers see the move bishop c7 is still equal. Maybe the bishop could take that well-placed knight at f4. Uh, but rook to g8 um, seems a little passive, and um, it is. And this is really the moment where all of this pressure that Farouge has been applying now comes, now begins to bear fruit. At, at this point, white is better, um, not just applying pressure, but on the board, he's theoretically in a better position now because the rook at g8 is passively placed. Uh, the knight goes to h4, piling onto that weak g6 square. Bishop to g7, knight f to g6, trying to maybe get rid of that f8 knight that holds that e6 pawn, that defends that e6 pawn. Now he's, he's working, you see, with the e6 weakness, let's just highlight that, and the g7 weakness, alternating threats between the two. If knight to g6, pawn would take king e7 and f4, and black would be in massive trouble at this point. He'd just be losing, I think. Um, so knight to d7 instead, rook h to e1, rook to e8, now bishop to f4. He, he doesn't want that bishop to trade off for a knight. He wants to keep his knights. So he offers a trade with a bishop, takes, takes, rook to d6. If he doesn't, there's actually a, a, still a pin on this, on this file because of the rook at, at uh, e8. Rook to d6 helps defend the d5 point. King to h3. Now. If he could, if he jumped in immediately with, say, knight to f5, trying to take advantage of that pin and hitting the rook at d6, the problem is pawn takes knight would be with check, and then he would actually lose. He'd have to move the king, and then rook takes, rook takes, and black would be up a piece. So what Ferruja does before playing that is play king to h3. So now knight to f5 is threatened because it wouldn't be check if the knight was retaken. The knight goes back to f8, and defending that pawn. Knight f to g6 to get rid of the defending knight. Knight to h7. Now f4, that helps keep the knight out of the g5 square, and also it can go to f5 uh, later. Rook d to d8 to remove that pin that was on the e file, so the e8 rook is now defended. Rook to g1, shifting now back to g7 as the target. He put as much pressure on e6 as possible. Now he's going back to g7. Knight to d6, rook e to g2, attacking g7. Let me highlight that. Again, rook to g8. So we've seen Ferruja go back and forth between e6 and g7, and now he's gotten black's pieces uncoordinated. And this is the tactical blow. Do you see it? I'll give you a second. That's right. Knight to e7, right into the lion's den. It looks like he's just hanging the knight right deep in black's position, but in fact, it's a winning move. It hits the rook at g8. If the rook just moved, white would just take g7 with his own rook. So he's really uh, forced to do something. If he takes the knight, which he doesn't do, then takes, 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 king e8 and rook h7, and with the passed h pawn, the game is easily winning for white. So black tries to mix things up a little bit. He plays knight to g5, check to sort of interfere with those rooks along the g-file. White takes, king takes on e7, gf6 check. He has to retake with the king. If he takes with the pawn, boom, another pin down the g-file. So he takes with the king. The weaknesses are piling up. Rook to g6 check, king to f7, and now knight to f3. And the threats of knight e5 and knight to g5 check are both devastating. Rook d to f8, knight to e5, check, forcing the king away from the g7 pawn. He finally gets, gets his, uh, his loot that he's been aiming at. King to e7, rook g7, check, rook takes, rook takes, king to f6, now h6. And first you might wonder if this was a mistake, because black now plays rook to h8, threatening rook takes h6, check. But Ferruja has a very nice combination to win the game. He plays king to g4, so the rook at h6 isn't in check. His opponent takes the pawn. So now, if you look carefully, you'll see that if the knight on d6 was not defending f7, rook f7 would be checkmate. So what does he do? Boom, rook to d7, hitting the knight forcing it away, and black resigned in this, in this position, 
because the only move, only way to not lose the knight is to move it, and if he moved it, rook to f7 would be make. This does remind me of Fisher. You create a small weakness, you work on it, create a second weakness, go back and forth between the two, then you strike with a brilliant tactic. A very strong game from Alareza Faruja. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog. See you again soon. Bye.